Happy 4th of July week, everybody. I'm so excited about today's conversation. We have a very special guest, uh, Charles Baker, Charlie Baker. Charles, Charles, I'm guessing is probably what most people know you as. Uh, but uh, this is a great conversation. He's a very talented actor. He's been in it so many projects, but recently, of course, The Mandalorian, Mayor of Kingstown, 1883, all of our favorite shows. But I mean, come on. Breaking Bad, El yeah. Camino. Uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate you hanging out with us today. Glad to be here. Glad to be here, man. Yes. Well, I, I'm i fascinated with your career because you have done so many projects and really proven what I consider to be just a very successful, measurable working actor. Like you've just done a lot of different things, right? Thank Obviously, you. we'll talk about the other things breaking bad and such i'm sure you've talked that to death but it is <laughs> it's part of your journey as a storyteller yeah. Yeah. i'm very curious to know and i always like to ask this right off the bat like how did you get into acting what was it that attracted you to it you're also a very accomplished musician too which i think we learned that in sort of an odd way but that was really that's been what you've done is you're classically trained so how, how did all of this come together for you oh yeah if it's really it, it's we're the products of our environment you know it's it's you know everything that that is me uh you know is what happened to me uh as growing up um i remember my I barely remember. I have pictures when I was a, you know, three, four years old. My sister was a cheerleader. My brothers were both on the football team. And my sister was on the sidelines cheering them on. And I went and joined her and started mimicking everything they did. And I just, you know, joined in. And, and of course, you know, little, little chubby, blonde haired kid in Hawaii, um, you know, was adorable doing, trying to do these little cheerleading. So they made me the honorary ma mascot, mascot of the, of the team. Um, and, uh, gave me a, you know, a pair of shorts that matched the, the cheerleader outfit and, you know, a little outfit that was, you know, for, for a little boy to, to join along. Um, and I think from then on, I just, it's been all about like, getting the getting the audience cheering for you um entertaining people more than than just you know than being an actor and i don't mean just an actor acting is it's a very complicated job <laughs> um but i i i started in music um I, I played violin when i at the same time when i was cheerleading when i was like four years old i was playing violin um but i had a very nomadic childhood Okay. My parents were divorced. My dad was a military officer, so he moved twice a year sometimes. My mom was extremely mentally ill, um, which, and <laughs> we lived below poverty level when I lived with mom. Mm -hmm. uh, she had custody of me. My dad had my other three siblings. Okay. Um, they were given a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't given a choice. Um, and so, uh, I moved two, three times a year, my entire childhood, there was never the same music classes available. So okay. any go, my mom was, was kind of just like, put him in something so that he's out of the way. So I, mm. you know, I took trumpet, I took drums, I took, uh, I played, I, I did multiple styles of martial arts, um, uh, judo, taekwondo. I played all of the sports. My dad was the same in, in a sense. He, with him being military and very competitive, I had to play all the sports. I had to be on the military base, baseball team, the football team, the basketball team, you name the team. I was probably on, on one of the teams, depending on the season. Mm wasn't by choice it was just what I did so I had this extremely eclectic set of experiences um, to draw from and I continued wanting to be a musician while I was I was going to be a music teacher because I didn't have the confidence that you need 
to to say I want to be a musician. I want to survive off of my art. Um, and I was doing that and I was singing for a band. Uh, the awesome name of Stargazer. Nice. Uh, that that fits. Yeah. I love that. That's great. It was a fun, it was a fun group. I was the oldest member of the band. I was actually the only one in the band who was legally aged old enough to drink. Um, <laughs> and we'd play in these bars and they would like, yeah, everyone gets a free drink. And they're like, oh, you're the only one who can drink. So here's, here's a bunch of alcohol for you. Um, <laughs> and that was pretty much the way I made it through as a, as a lead singer for a band. I didn't have any stage presence other than I sang. Um, and the band seemed to like the way I sing. I've never really liked the way I sing, but I did it anyway. Um, but I overheard them having a band meeting without me one time and the conversation, and I wasn't supposed to hear it, but I was going to listen in. Um, and the conversation ended up going on to about how I had no stage presence and how wow. like I, he can sing, but the audience is, I had this kind of Jim Morrison kind of like, I would rather just stand with my back to the audience and, and sing and then just like, uh, you know, let them let the rest of the band carry it. And, and they didn't really appreciate that. And I went, uh, I need to try and improve my stage presence. So I'm going to focus more on the acting. Okay. Part. And, and things I was in college, I was doing musical theater. I love singing and dancing. I that was two of the things I, you know, I studied ballet and tap jazz, uh, over my career of learning new stuff. Um, and I was a gymnast. Uh, and so it all kind of, I was doing musicals. And so the theater director asked me to do a play. I went, uh, I guess. Um, and at during rehearsals, it was like, you know, just repeat the lines, repeat the lines. Then we got to our first performance and I was on stage and I was in the middle of a scene and I didn't see an audience. I saw a courtroom, you know, it was, I was playing a lawyer and I was in a courtroom and I felt like a lawyer and I was defending my case and I was, I was really in the moment and I never really understood what actors talked about when they talk about being in the moment, but I was there and um, it kind of hooked me. It's, uh, it had this wow. <clears throat> strong impact on me and I went, eh, I'm going to keep doing this. And so I was trained more. Wow. And it really worked out well for you. We have similar stories growing up in a divorced family, not, not the sibling part, but, you know, just traveling and, and having one parent who struggled with mental illness and then a dad who just tried to over adapt in other areas and just try and make life normal. Uh, so I get that part and I really appreciate your honesty on that. Yeah. So it, I could see having that life experience and then how it somehow the way the universe works i think uh, boosted you into the arts and storytelling yeah. because i'm guessing and please correct me if i'm wrong but it it gave you it sounds like it gave you like an opportunity to it's an almost like an escapism in a way to really be something different than what your life is like and i think most of the time that's a pretty common thread with actors yeah. Uh, or comics <laughs> that you know in some way shape or form uh, but not in a wounded sense but really just going okay I can draw from this and I imagine it's probably lent itself well to you yeah. throughout your successful career yeah. as an actor I was doing a Shakespeare play in my college days um, and one of the the director of of the show came out on the first day of rehearsal and he said we're all here because we're not all there and i was like cool i'm with i'm with my people now <laughs> i love it it's like a tribe you know what i'm saying yeah. like that's how i feel about doing this it's like a lot of these people i met you know before or just before covid and really have built a community uh, although we've all gone our separate ways and done different things so that's very cool and you eventually made your way out to whether well, was it LA at some point, I imagine, and yeah. started doing things. Now, I'm very interested to know, I want to switch gears, but in the same vein, you're a very recognizable person. 
and and here I love to just talk to people and just allow them to to be themselves a little bit and just kind of not have to perform necessarily. And I'm very curious. Obviously, people connect you with those two shows that we mentioned. I know you're very appreciative, and I get that. But are there ever moments where it's just like exhausting for you? Not complaining, but you're just like, man, I you know I want to give to the people, but it's like this was a part of my life. I'm thankful for it. But it's also like part of it's compacted in a way as just part of your uh, resume in a way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's Breaking Bad was like one of the greatest things to happen for me. The timing, uh, just the situation, everything was just perfect. And it, it, I, I wouldn't want anything different. Um, there are aspects of it that are painful to me sure yes i had a lot of cousins uh who were overweight and i was constantly being shamed for being skinny oh wow constantly being shamed just like ragged on told i don't eat enough told i don't do enough told i don't and so being called skinny all the time <laughs> yeah. takes a little bit thicker skin and it, it you know there are times when I'm like my friend just call me Charlie you don't have to keep calling me skinny <laughs> thanks yeah I mean it's interesting because of what you do I, I learned this early on because when I see you on television and you do such great work whether it's the current projects that you're in doesn't matter and and I feel like people think perhaps maybe that they know you in a way because they see you do certain things like, obviously, you're the complete antithesis of any of the characters that you've ever played, whether it's Skinny Pete or like the Scout and the Mandalorian or somebody in, you know, uh, Mare. It just, you know what I mean? So it's like people almost probably kind of feel like they know you in a way. And so they feel like this certain unspoken level of comfortability and they just they want you to quote lines or they want you to perform a little bit. And you're probably like, if you're cruising through the airport or wherever, or maybe you're back in Albuquerque visiting family or friends and they just want to call it. I could see that, you know, uh, or, Hey, can you say this line or that line? Cause I imagine you're a human being first and foremost, it's kind of like a blessing and a curse in a way, some ways, obviously. And I get that you're thankful. I think I totally get that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give, I wouldn't. Yeah, but I could be like, okay, we get it. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) I, just call me Charlie, you know, or Charles, you know, that's, that'll do if you want to take a picture or whatever, or just let's get, do it instead of having, I don't know, maybe people get nervous around you. I don't know, but I get it. It, It's very interesting to hear. It's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you live with it. I don't, I don't, um, I'm not mad at anybody who calls me. No, of course not. I I don't, uh, I don't discourage people from calling me skinny Pete and and skinny, but uh, um, you know, it's interesting how that became the the thing. I'm not even the skinniest dude on Breaking Bad. Um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, I'm 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 not. You know, I, I'm 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 under average for for my height. Yes, but I'm not like bone skinny. I'm just you know I'm I'm thin boned. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting. It's just an interesting. Uh, dynamic for me um i also i've i've always fought this stereotype of being like a white trash scumbag drug addict um and honestly i have two older brothers i mentioned they both ended up in prison because of drugs wow Um, i did not go that route i did not want to go to prison i've heard some pretty bad things about the place um (laughs) and so I didn't follow their their lead and a lot of playing piano singing opera trying to do these refined arts um was a way to to fight off that that stereotype um and to be the the epitome now of your illiterate drug addict (laughs) (laughs) yes it's another you know it's another one of those like man i wish people didn't think that i actually was that person right Uh, and like you said there people do kind of have this expectation of what they expect from me and i have seen 
and I, again, I'm not complaining. It's I I understand, but I've seen this like disappointment in people's eyes when they meet me and face to face, and I'm not like, yo, what up, yo, church. Um, they're just kind of like, oh, you're just a, a guy. Like, yeah, I really am. Yeah, I'm a, just a human. I'm a, I have a family. I'm like normal. It's interesting. I'm, yeah, I, I I could see that. Yeah, I could yeah. see that for sure. Um, and like I I don't. I understand there are a lot of celebrities who create a persona mm -hmm. um, and that's the persona that we all see when they're on camera. I, I feel like an idiot for, you know, showing up to the masquerade party as myself, but here I am. I, I came out the first time on camera just as me without any thought of like, Hey, I should pretend to be something I'm not. Um, so that people can, you know, enjoy their fantasy. Like I'm, I do acting as a job. I want to be known as somebody who can act, act, and who is a chameleon, not somebody who is like, oh yeah, he's he's a skinny drug addict, so he plays all the skinny drug addict parts, and like that's that's ridiculous. If what corporation would want to hire an actual drug addict? <laughs> no. <laughs> Like it's really hard. You, know, you can. There are drug addicts that that slip through, for whatever reasons. But like the typical drug addict doesn't have the like discipline to maintain a working actor's lifestyle. No. <laughs> Not at all. No, no. I, I totally get that. Well, so, when that show ended, yeah, it just was it hard as an actor to book other roles. Did people have this idea of? who you were as an actor in your range, or was that just not really an issue for you once that part of your life ended? Um, I, I don't think it really hurt that much. And part of it, it was, I wasn't going to let it, you know, I, okay. as you have an you have agents, I have a manager, I have agents. Um, I could have gone in like, yeah, anytime that look i don't want to be a stereotype i i ended up doing a lot of stereotypical roles playing scumbags and low lives but like i'm not looking for those roles in particular if they have a, an option if it's like hey we want him we'd love him to read for this scumbag or even better if you're going to give me an offer for a scumbag let me at least audition for a role you don't think i'm right for yeah I'd rather I'd rather get up and show you what I can do is something you don't think I'm right for than do the thing that you think that I am, you know, because um, that's just it's one is boring to just play the same character over and over again. Yeah. Um, uh, and two, it's it's um, I don't know, it's it's too easy. It's it would just be too too easy to to maintain that kind of um thing but it wouldn't be fulfilling at all um right but i went directly from breaking bad to the blacklist yeah and that was a great role for you too on the blacklist yeah that was a huge reason why i wanted that role was because it was he was nothing like skinny pete um the funny thing is not, you know up until recently a lot of people haven't been making the connection that it's the same guy <laughs> um, so uh, now i need to get people just like recognize that oh oh that's the guy that's in this too oh it's the same guy um i think that was a big part of it when i auditioned for the blacklist i don't know if they went oh wait, look we can get the guy from breaking bad they went oh this guy's interesting who is he <laughs> yeah and that's what you want as an actor right is to people find you interesting yeah. and go so was it hard for you when they came to you with the el camino idea to come back again or was it like okay this is an opportunity to really close this story out and yeah. and i'm asking just from an actor's perspective as a professional hard-working actor who again i i really can't overemphasize who has been so successful you're very talented on so many levels uh but was it like okay we'll just take this out for a run one more time and then that's it uh so a little bit of that i wasn't okay. i was thrilled that they actually had an idea for a continue continuation of of breaking mm -hmm. bad um i did i did want to have some closure for for skinny pete um but 
more than anything, the idea that Vince Gilligan knew when he wrote that, that I would be playing Skinny Pete. Um, that was a huge compliment. Like okay. he, he, he wrote that some really neat stuff for my character to, to do and say, knowing that I was going to be the one who's done that. And I don't think I've had any caliber of anyone that caliber write something specifically for me. Okay. Um, and that was a huge, that was like the biggest part of it. And that they would, and I knew Vince, Vince isn't a, a just money grabber. He's not going to make something that he doesn't believe in. A cash grab just for. Yeah. 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 Um, that's the reason why Breaking Bad had six seasons is because he knew when he started, I'm going to end this before it gets stupid, before we start jumping the shark. You know, yeah, I love that exam jumping the shark. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, what's important to you as a storyteller? Like what yeah. what what do you look for? Like writing obviously something that's different than what you've done. Like what is important to to you, Charles, as an actor, like when you want to sink your teeth into something? I, I love seeing the humanity in a role. Um I'm I'm uh compelling stories interesting stories new new stories or new takes on old stories i mean it's hard to come up with anything really new but um i do a lot of remakes of tv shows and uh like old movies that are now have become tv shows perry mason and um it's really neat to be attached to that kind of old school uh memory of, of a show that I watched, you know, on black and white as a child. Um, but at the same time, I'd rather do stuff like Breaking Bad, where like, nobody's seen this before. Nobody's, nobody's tried to tell a story like this before, where we take a milk toast dude and make him into a villain and try and keep the audience to still like him throughout the whole journey. You know, that's a new thing. We're usually going the other way around, you know, where <laughs> uh, we have a bad guy who kind of, you know, turns better, you know, uh, kind of story. And like stuff that makes people feel um, whatever the feeling is, I'd prefer not they feel scared. I'd prefer people, you know, makes people think or makes people just emotional, you know, whether it's... Um, from connection or you know from a, a you know just happiness you know just something that makes people really like feel joy that's that's what i look for in a story if if i read a script and it and i'm like uh, what story are we you um i'm usually like eh, no thank you um but if i see something that really like hits um, that's what I'm looking for. And characters who are like that, characters who have some humanity, even the bad characters, if they have some kind of like empath empathetic traits, something that we can identify with, um, that's what I mostly look for. That I love page. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's so cool. So looking back at when you started your career to now, like what are one or two things that you've learned along the way that really have helped you just sustain yourself mentally as a storyteller, as a human being to keep you going and keep you motivated. Like starting out, it's always rough for most people unless they just get really lucky and have a, a quick burn. Uh, you've worked hard and just continued to go up the ladder, but is there anything that you've learned about yourself or that you've taught yourself that you wish you would have known then that would have helped you now? I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really, I mean, it's really hard to say. I've I've learned a whole bunch um, about uh, patience and persistence. I mean, that's mostly mostly the gig is um, just not giving up and really understanding that this business, show business is very much a business yeah and that um the more you think of it like a business the more you treat it like a business the less personal it becomes 
Um, and that's been a huge, I mean, it's hard to separate when you're, it's your livelihood to separate it as, as not being personal, but you know, when you don't get a role, it's just, it's not for you, you know? Um, and knowing that, you know, the right roles will come at the right time. And if they don't, then it's not the right time and you just need to keep working at it. And, um, I've, I've learned a long time ago that, uh, you know, one out of every three actors make it in this business because the other two give up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's it's, it would be so easy to, it, it, every, every time I'm in between jobs, it'd be so easy for me to just go, I can't do this anymore. Um, Cause it's really hard. It's, it's really, really kind of, you're constantly swinging on this pendulum between fluffy soft pillows and razor sharp spikes. And um, it's this like emotional <laughs> kind of a kind of ride you get to go on. If, if you take it all too personally, it'll, it'll just drag you down. Um, and uh, this is not my last job. It's something, it's a mantra I have every time I'm working on a gig I, you know, while I'm getting ready, I'm standing there looking in the mirror going, this is not my last job. I'll have another job after this because it's, you know, I, I look back and I did a count. And I average about six jobs a year. That's and really good for most working actors in Los Angeles. Most working actors. Now for, if, if you were in any other business and you had to t do an interview, send out applications and do an interview six times a year exhausting in order to maintain your health insurance and feed your family um you'd be like constantly frazzled too um i've only recently i've been doing this 16 years a little little over 16 years i've only recently started to get to where when i'm not working like on a saturday or sunday i actually just enjoy a saturday and sunday as opposed to panic about what i'm going to do next <laughs> about how i'm going to get more work um i've on, only recently gotten to where i just i don't completely have a panic attack about my next job um even though i've you know at this point i haven't really worked in a couple of weeks and i don't know what's coming up next and you know we have the writer's strike going on possibly a screen actor strike about to happen with any you know unless things go really, really well <laughs> in their extended negotiations. So we're, um, you know, you never know what's, what's going to happen. And um, just, it's constantly on edge. Um, a lot of people have this old school idea of what actors make and, uh, you know, like you say, they make assumptions. And um, I made the assumption when I started, you know, that if I had worked doing what I'm doing now, I'd be set for life. And ooh, that's far from true. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very, far. very far from true. <laughs> and I learned that early on too, just talking to great people uh, that like, it's not like, yeah, you were on for all these seasons. And I've heard uh, your other co-stars talk about, you know, that you shared scenes with or that you worked with where they were like literally struggling you know, or maybe still waiting tables at the time. Now I think people probably do DoorDash or Uber or whatever, right. you know, yeah. to keep the bills paid. Uh, you have a beautiful home in there that you're in. So like you've got a mortgage <laughs> and that's the part I think that really sucks about all of this is that like we just came out of a pandemic and things were really starting to crease up again, but it's not for good cause. You know, everybody needs a fair deal. Um, but at the same time, you, you know, that's where you have to learn the business of show business and learn how to budget and to be smart about your money and, you know, uh, clout chasing or whatever. It's a struggle, but, you know, because you've reached that point, you obviously you're, you're in it to win it. So like, you'll get work. I mean, there's other things coming, but it's just a matter of like the when and the how and how <laughs> that's all going to work out, you know? Wow. Yeah. So fascinating, man. This has just been Always, a treat. You're just so fun. That's, I get it. It's crazy. It's, it's fun. Um, you know, there's also the, like, where am I going to live next year? Because the show that I might get might be shooting somewhere else. Yeah. yeah.
and, and they may need a, a nine month commitment of me staying somewhere else for a while. And my family is like, they're, we're not moving. <laughs> like We're here. <laughs> so wherever you go, you're going yourself. Um, and so I, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff and I, I wouldn't change anything of it. I mean, it's, I, um, it's hard. It's, it's supposed to be hard. Um, we're, we're all, we all have to find our own way to struggle through. And so, um, we do, uh, I, I have, I've had a lot of like, a lot of help along the way. And I've had a lot of, um, I've been privileged to, to get where I am, um, with the family I now have, uh, not the family I used to have, but now with the family I have now, um, you know, it's, uh, one of my ancestors, Abraham Lincoln, once said, uh, I, I'm, I'm the man, I became successful because somebody once believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's a big part of it. And the With family that. probably motivates you too. I mean, you've got a family to take care of. So, yeah. uh, it's hard I, to have, be... I have no other marketable skills. Prior <laughs> to being an actor, I, I you know, was a short order cook at Denny's. So, um, and there's no way that's going to replace what what I uh, could make as an actor. And so, I'm kind of like I'm in it now. <laughs> there's, there's not much else I could do. So, um, what you gonna do <laughs> keep right at it well yeah. thank you charles yeah, for your time yeah it's you're the best man this is thank cool you. and i think this will inspire a lot of people because really the big theme of all of this is just you have to keep going and you have to keep a perspective otherwise you'll just and that's in anything but especially as an actor because it's a rough world that you're in it, yeah it can be but on the other side of it it is like it is the ultimate dream you know i get uh, doing the Mandalorian for three weeks, I got paid to to go LARPing with a bunch of stuntmen, um, playing Star Wars and shooting at stormtroopers. And other people would pay thousands of dollars for that experience. And you know, so I, you know, you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both. There you have facts of life. Love it, Charles. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Right on, man. Great talking to you. Likewise.